Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. I'm Allison. And I'm Darren. And we're four voices you don't usually hear all together on the same podcast. It's through the magic of technology. <laughs> so it's the Endless Knot joining forces with... Mistake. Mistake. Very good. <laughs> we can speak in unison with that. <laughs> you guys are coordinated better than us. <laughs> so yeah, we're all joining up because our podcasts are so clearly overlapping and we've had so many conversations over the last, oh, I don't know, year, maybe, about the material that we all cover sure. that we yeah. thought it was time that we all get together and do something together. Yeah. So we've tackled the Greek myth source side like we usually do mm -hmm. and I understand you guys have tackled the etymology and word side of things <laughs> <laughs> yeah well since our podcast tends to talk about classical and medieval and language uh, aspects of the ancient world the medieval world and English mm -hmm. well what we decided to do as you know is the myth of Theseus and Ariadne and Mark, it was you who actually proposed this. It was, yeah, because I'd done a video that touched on this topic a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So our podcast, we play that audio from that video, which is about the word clue and its connection to the story of Theseus and Ariadne. And so what we suggested to you guys was that you guys could talk about the story in its Greek origins. So I understand you looked at some dithyrams? Yes. Yes. We did. We looked at two dithyrams, Pachylides. About 476 right. BC, kind of old, a precursor to classical Athenian tragedy. And there are little dramatic lyrics that tell a little bit of a story about Theseus's arrival in Athens and the contest with Minos. Yeah, they focus on two specific episodes in the story of Theseus. Yeah. So his arrival in Athens after he does his labors along the way. Mm -hmm. And then an episode on his way to kill the Minotaur. Yeah, so we <laughs> the best part, the killing of the Minotaur is not in the section that we decided to discuss, but we <laughs> just didn't write that, so I can't really talk about that. <laughs> we kind of know how that one turned out anyway, so it's not really spoiler alert required. <laughs> well, that's the thing about being constrained by your actual source texts. I think people are often surprised at how how many of our most famous myths don't survive in a narrative form in their original Greek. Yeah, the sources are pretty limiting. And people like to think that there's like, you know, a book of Greek myths. Yeah, and right. everything you need to know about every Greek myth is told in a book. And, and it's, it's really indexed. just... Yeah, yeah, it's fully. just piecing little bits together here and there. Yeah, and and mm -hmm. mythological time is the is exactly like real world time. That's another big thing that we encounter often. Yeah, like, didn't Hero A do this to? As if it makes logical sense. Exactly, yeah, chronology, right? It's yeah. hard to mm -hmm. escape that. If you guys talked about the origins of Theseus, that's good because what we ended up talking about was my, as you'll hear absolute favorite version of the story, which is in Catullus and his poem 64, where he, again, doesn't actually talk directly about the Theseus and the Minotaur. <laughs> in fact, I think we basically avoided talking about the Minotaur no. <laughs> directly at all. This is an epic episode. <laughs> yeah, we've brilliantly sidestepped. <laughs> the most famous part of it. I did talk about it a little yeah. bit, but uh, he portrays Ariadne abandoned by Theseus. And so I, we talked about that poem and then I went into the consequence of the myth being translated into English, primarily by Geoffrey Chaucer in the 14th century, and how that kicks off uh, an etymology of a very common word, the word clue, and how that kicks off a whole train of events that leads through criminology to detective fiction, and then in a kind of circuitous path all the way back to Greek myth again. Right on. Well, that's good. That's good stuff. And circuitous paths is important. Yes. <laughs> lots and lots of circuitous paths through lab labyrinthine twists. Yes. Well, we do mention Procustian. Yeah, and Labyrinthine and Labrys at the end when we're out of our narrative. Right. Well, there you go. <laughs> but, that's good, actually, because I don't think we talked about the word labyrinth. 
No, not the, not the word labyrinth itself. That's yeah, true. so I'm glad okay. you covered yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll have some pictures on our blog as well to supplement that. Uh, right, yeah. of the Minoan stuff. Yeah, so yeah. some Minoan stuff. Good. Cool. All right. Well, I think then, so anyone who's listening to either of our podcasts definitely needs to check out the other podcast <laughs> for, sure. for all of the material that complements what each of us is talking about. That was our plan, and I think it's turned out pretty well. Well, to get a whole picture, right? Let's yeah. put the pieces That's together. Right. That would be the best way of doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we had fun doing this with you guys, and we hope you guys had fun with this project too. Mm-hmm. Indeed, and it's, indeed. And it's been fun to actually get a chance to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Really, basically, we do this podcast stuff just so that we can have an excuse to talk to people that we don't otherwise get to talk to except on the internet. So, hello. <laughs> yeah, hello. That works. It works. The excuse is a good excuse. We'll, we'll yeah. call it something academic like outreach. That's yeah. what we'll call it. Yes, or, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. Or, absolutely. Or some Very sort serious. Of academic networking, serious, <laughs> serious stuff. Interdisciplinary kind of yes, yes. interdisciplinary. That's what we're being. Yeah, it's a good sure. buzzword. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I no, prefer no, no. transdisciplinary. Transdisciplinary. Yeah, prefer, oh, there we yeah. go. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, because Very good. it's not just just two nodes talking yeah. to each other. It's everything in between. Yeah. Right? right. So it's all across. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's good stuff. And not procrustean in the slightest. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. We're not going to be chopping off any limbs or legs. Yeah. All right. So. That's The Endless Knot and Myth Take. take. <laughs> and we will now turn to the substance of both of our discussions. Talk to you later, Allison and Darren. Talk, Talk to you, you guys later. later. Mark and Evan, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Just before we get to the main event, two last notes. First, we want to say thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, James Murray. Thank you again. Thanks. And second, of course... We're drinking cocktails. Of course. Tonight, we're drinking a cocktail called, both of us the same one, a cocktail called Bull's Blood. Indeed. Now, since we've already introduced the topic of tonight's discussion, it should be fairly obvious why we went with Bull's Blood. Indeed. It's not really what I would have expected from a cocktail of that name, however. No, you would have kind of expected something red. <laughs> Possibly, <laughs> or dark black, yeah. or uh, something thick and powerful. Mm -hmm. No, it is pretty strong. Yes. But what this is, a is a combination, at least the version we used, equal parts white rum, brandy, and Grand Marnier, and then two parts, on top of that, of orange juice. And because we were just finishing up brandy, I ended up making super big cocktails for the two of us since I based it off the amount of brandy we had left. But, you know, as Mark said, it's got some orange juice in it and that apparently, what was it you it said? undoes the uh, alcohol. Undoes the alcohol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, cheers. Healthy, not healthy, you know, treatment with opposites. Yeah, we moved past the Middle Ages, you know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I will say, it is pretty powerful. It is not a weak cocktail. So if we're slurring by the end of the podcast, you'll know why. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's why it's called a bull's blood, but I really don't know. I don't know why no. that, that name, but it did seem appropriate. And it's quite tasty. Mm -hmm. Very orangey. I think the, the bull's blood may have something to do with the fact that you're supposed to use Spanish brandy. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's Spanish bullfight fighters somehow. Yeah. Right. Uh, Spanish or oranges. Oranges, in oranges Spain. of course, in Spain. And yeah. Okay. So I guess it has something to do yeah. with that. All right. And now let's turn to the voiceover for the video Clue, in which we ask the question, what does Greek myth have to do with fingerprints and detective stories? The answer lies in the story of Ariadne and Theseus. Ariadne was the daughter of Minos, king of Crete. Minos failed to sacrifice a particular white bull to the sea god Poseidon as he'd promised, and so that god punished him by making his wife Pasiphae, mother of Ariadne, fall in love with the bull. And, well, let's just say the result was a half-man, half-bull, the famous Minotaur. So King Minos puts the Minotaur in the labyrinth, puts his daughter Ariadne in charge of the labyrinth, and feeds the Minotaur the seven youths and seven maidens that Minos extracts from the city of Athens as a tribute. This is where Theseus comes into the story. Theseus comes to Crete to kill the Minotaur and free Athens from its obligation. Upon his arrival, Ariadne immediately falls in love with him and promises to tell him how to accomplish his task if he'll promise to marry her and take her away with him. She gives him a sword and a ball of thread for him to unravel as he goes into the labyrinth. 
After killing the Minotaur he is able to retrace his path by following the thread and escapes. Theseus does then take Ariadne away with him, only to later abandon her on the deserted island of Naxos on his way home to Athens. Jerk. Actually, in some versions of the myth Theseus is made to leave her behind by a god, either Dionysus because he wanted her for himself, or by Athena, goddess of wisdom and protector of heroes and of Athens, who leads him away for his own good. This practice of assigning motivations to the gods, especially for seemingly inexplicable or dishonourable actions by heroes, is common in Greek myth, and is sometimes seen as a very early theory of emotions and psychology. But what does all this have to do with the word clue? Well, the word used to be spelled C-L-E-W, and came from the Old English word kluen, which meant ball, particularly a ball of string or yarn, and in some parts of northern England and Scotland it's still used in that sense. When writing about the story of Ariadne, clue was the word English writers like Geoffrey Chaucer in the 14th century would use. There too have I a remedy in my thought, that by a clue of twine, as he hath gone, the same way he may return anon, following alway the thread, as he hath come. In fact, this mythological reference was so common that it came to have a figurative sense, and gradually the literal meaning of a ball of thread disappeared, leaving only the meaning of that which points the way to a solution, by around the 17th century. So a whole new meaning for the word grew out of one specific narrative reference. Of course the textile arts are a common thread in Greek myth, from the story of Ariadne and Theseus to the spinning, measuring, and cutting of the metaphorical thread of life by the three fates, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. The other really famous example is the story of Penelope, wife of Odysseus, one of the heroes at the Trojan War. During Odysseus' very long absence, a ten-year siege at Troy followed by a ten-year return journey home, Penelope had to fend off the advances of many suitors who wanted to marry her and take over the kingdom of Ithaca. One of the ploys Penelope used was to ask the suitors for a delay until after she finished weaving the death shroud for her father-in-law. Secretly each night she unraveled the previous day's progress, thus ensuring it would never be complete. At least until her deception was discovered. Like Ariadne's clue, Penelope's unraveling became a common narrative reference, even in modern literature. But back to the word clue. It comes ultimately from an Indo-European root that meant to gather into a mass, conglomerate, or curl, and leads eventually through various language paths like Germanic, Latin, and Greek to many modern English words such as glue, globe, claw, clench, cling, and clay. Through Greek we get the word neuroglia, or simply glia. The glial cells in the brain support and protect the neurons, the main brain cells involved in cognition, kind of gluing them together, hence the name, to collectively make up the grey matter of the brain though recent research suggests that the glial cells may also play a more active role in cognition, but neuroscientists still have a lot of threads to unpick before they'll have completely unraveled that mystery. We now often think of clues, at least in terms of detective fiction as well as in real life criminology, as trace evidence, fibres from clothing, DNA, footprints, etc. that a criminal leaves behind at a crime scene. This idea in forensic science was first formulated by Edmund Locard that every contact will leave a trace and the criminal will both leave behind and take away physical evidence which can be used to solve the crime. This is now known as Locard's exchange principle, and perhaps the most famous and transformative example of trace evidence, and the most cliched detective story clue, is the fingerprint. The development of the science of fingerprinting in the 19th century is somewhat murky and mired in controversy. We'll start the story with Henry Falds, a Scottish physician who went to Japan to found a hospital. While there, Falds became friends with a naturalist, Edward Morse, whose study of shell mounds, basically dumping grounds for shells, had been praised by the likes of Charles Darwin. Morse had also become interested in Japanese pottery because of the fragments that were also often found in those shell mounds, and contributed significantly to the study of Japanese ceramics. Falds accompanied his friend to the archaeological sites and noticed that he could see the labyrinthine pattern of ridges of the potter's fingerprints still visible on the surface of the fragments. Struck by this clue preserved in the clay, remember that clay comes from the same Indo-European root, he surmised that the pattern of these fingerprints was different for each individual and could be used to identify them. He began to study the matter collecting fingerprints and experimenting and determined that they were permanent and unchanging over a person's lifetime. Then one day Fald's hospital was burgled and though the police suspected a staff member, Fald's believed in the person's innocence and used fingerprint evidence to prove it. Seeing the obvious importance of his discovery, Falds brought his idea first to Charles Darwin, who passed it on to his cousin Francis Galton. Galton, like his and Darwin's grandfather Erasmus Darwin, was a bit of a polymath. In fact, that's kind of the point with Galton, a member of the great Darwin Wedgwood family. That's Wedgwood as in Josiah Wedgwood, noted not for studying pottery, but making it. 
The family was filled with bright lights, and Galton was interested in studying the inherited traits of talent and genius, coining both the concept and the word eugenics, and the phrase nature versus nurture. Galton was also a counting fanatic and tried to quantify everything mathematically, including women's beauty, compiling a beauty map of Britain. Spoiler: London rated highest, Aberdeen lowest. And the efficacy of prayer. Spoiler: none at all. And developed the science of statistics and the concepts of correlation, regression towards the mean, and standard deviation. So it's not surprising that he'd be interested in fingerprinting. Except he wasn't at first. And when he did turn his attention to it some years later, he either ignored or forgot about the work of Falds, leaving him feeling miffed, and instead turned to the evidence of a man named William Herschel. Herschel years earlier, unbeknownst to Falds, began using fingerprints not for criminal detection but for contract verification. Herschel, and if his name sounds familiar, that's because he was the grandson of the famous astronomer of the same name who discovered Uranus, and son of another famous astronomer, John Herschel, so I suppose genius ran in his family too, Herschel was an officer in India who, having trouble with people pretending their signatures had been forged, hit upon the idea of taking fingerprints as well as signatures on contracts to avoid this. Herschel had compiled a large collection of fingerprints, which he passed on to Galton, who established the scientific study of fingerprints and began a system for classification. Herschel later sent Galton's book on fingerprinting to an old friend in India, Henry Cotton, Chief Secretary of the Government of Bengal, who forwarded it to Edward Henry, the Inspector General of Police in Bengal. Henry started to implement fingerprinting for police purposes, but finding Galton's classification system too complex, developed, with considerable help from two of his Bengali assistants, Azizul Haq and Hem Chandra Bose, a new simpler system, now known as the widely used Henry classification system. Henry's assistants didn't, at least initially, get their deserved recognition for their work, so I guess this story is full of failure to give credit where it's due. In any case, in 1901, a fingerprint bureau was established by Edward Henry, now Assistant Commissioner of Scotland Yard, and in 1902, a man named Harry Jackson became the first man in Britain to be convicted on the basis of fingerprint evidence for a thumbprint he left on a freshly painted windowsill. The crime? Burglary and theft of a set of billiard balls. A few years later, in 1905, the brothers Alfred and Albert Stratton were the first to be convicted of a major crime, robbery and murder of a paint shop owner due to a fingerprint they left on the cash box. But getting back to clues in detective fiction, the 1903 Sherlock Holmes story The Adventure of the Norwood Builder by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, set some years earlier in 1894, had already featured fingerprint evidence in a murder case, not to mention many other stories using trace evidence and other forensic techniques such as footprints, tobacco ash, and handwriting analysis, and notably the distinctive types of clay found on people's shoes. Sherlock Holmes as a detective is in fact famous for solving crimes by searching for physical clues. Agatha Christie later on poked fun at Conan Doyle's famous detective, including a very Holmes-like character, a police detective named Monsieur Giraud, in the novel Murder on the Links. Giraud is a meticulous clue finder whom Hercule Poirot calls a human foxhound, and he is misled in the case by trace evidence. Poirot instead chooses to use his little grey cells. Remember the neurons and glia of the grey matter? And solves the case through criminal psychology. As he says, when you have two crimes precisely similar in design and execution, you find the same brain behind them both. I am looking for that brain, Monsieur Giroux, and I shall find it. Here we have a true clue, a psychological clue. You may know all about cigarettes and matches, Monsieur Giroux, but I, Hercule Poirot, know the mind of man. So, like the Greeks using their gods as explanations for people's actions, Poirot is concerned with the motivations behind the crimes, and this brings us full circle back to ancient Greek myth, which seems to have been a particular inspiration for Agatha Christie. Hercule Poirot's name is obviously reminiscent of the Greek hero Hercules, whom Christie specifically recalls with her book titled The Labours of Hercule, playing on the myth of the Twelve Labours of Hercules and one of her recurring characters, who is a mystery writer stand-in for Christie herself, is named Ariadne Oliver, bringing us back to the story of the labyrinth. And finally, recalling both the figures of Ariadne and Penelope, and the importance of textiles in Greek myth, is Miss Marple, who is always knitting in her books. In the novel, the mirror cracked from side to side, when she complains to her doctor about being old and having to recuperate from an illness, this conversation occurs. And even my knitting, such a comfort that has always been, and I really am a good knitter. Now I drop stitches all the time, and quite often I don't even know I drop them. Haydock looked at her thoughtfully, 
Then his eyes twinkled. There's always the opposite. Now, what do you mean by that? If you can't knit, what about unraveling for a change? Penelope did. I'm hardly in her position. But unraveling's rather in your line, isn't it? <laughs> I had forgot how very much acting there was in this one. <laughs> Dramatic. <laughs> very. Um, yes, those voices of other than Mark were me, obviously, failing utterly to do accents. <laughs> and my father, in fact, with Hercule and uh, the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> my father is quite fond of doing accents. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether he's good at it or not. <laughs> right. So where do we want to go from there? Well, why don't we start with the myth, as I did in the video. All right. So there's a lot of versions of Theseus and Ariadne, and I know that Alison and Darren are going to be talking about the Greek origins of this story, so I, Indeed. I want to leave that in their hands, so go ahead and listen to their discussion of those sources. I thought I would spend a few minutes talking about my favorite version of this myth. Your favorite poet. <laughs> my favorite poet and my favorite version of the myth, and probably my favorite poem by my favorite poet. Oh, wow. So buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the poem 64 by Catullus, which is a little tiny mini epic. Really, really, really mini. So it's known as an Apillion, but I won't get into why that name is a bit weird. It is the story, the whole poem is the story of the wedding of Peleus and Thetis. Peleus and Thetis are the parents of Achilles. Okay. Okay. So it starts with Peleus going off on the Argo, the great mm -hmm. ship with the Argonauts, and falling in love with Thetis, one of the sea goddesses who mm -hmm. looks at this first boat. She comes out to look at the first boat, exposing her breasts, and he falls in love with her. And then they end up marrying. But basically, the, the story uh, in the poem is the story of their wedding. However... Inset inside, it's a, it's a poem of great complexity in terms of its structure, which I will not tell, worry you about. But inset within the wedding, there is another story. And this story is what's called a necrasis, which is a description of a work of art in poetry. Mm -hmm. And this story is the story of Theseus and Ariadne, or very specifically the story of Ariadne. And we'll get back to that. I think that's a really important point, which I know we want to talk about. And I'm going to give, I, I'm not going to redo all of the, or even substantial chunks of the poem because it is very, quite long, but I want to introduce how the story is introduced. Okay. So we get the guests coming to the wedding and there's human guests who come and then they leave behind their fields and everything and come to the wedding. And the house smiles with magnificent royal opulence and the bride's bed stands ready for the goddess remember Thetis is a goddess in the inner hall inlaid with Indian tusk and quilted with a murex purpled cloth so there's a cloth over the bridal bed a purple cloth embroidered on this coverlet were figures of antique times marvelously representing heroic enterprise here Ariadne on the surf booming shore of Naxos gazes at Theseus and his shipmates, making off, and, still incredulous of what she sees, feels love, a wild beast, tear at her. No wonder, for having woken from a deluding sleep, she finds herself abandoned pitiably on the bare sands, while he, oblivious, batters the sea with oars, leaving behind meaningless promises for the gale to play with. And then it goes on to describe, ostensibly it's describing an embroidered image, so a, a static image, but it moves much beyond that into a description of her standing with her clothes falling off in the water. It's very clearly and strongly erotic, you know, losing her coverings from her hair and from her breasts and from her feet because she's so upset. And it, it then goes into a flashback of the story. It gives a very capsule summary of the actual story of the plague and the city of, of Athens sending the what, what you summarized in, in right. the story and how she fell in love with him. He promised to marry her and take her away. And then she helps him and he goes in to the fight. And then just to read a little bit. So the hero toppled the monstrous bull whose quelled bulk lay goring thin air with ineffectual horns and safe and famous then retraced his steps, feeling his winding way by the fine thread she'd given him to save him from bewilderment in the tricky zigzag galleries that formed the labyrinth's indecipherable maze. There are some liberties taken there with the translation because the, because the Latin, appropriately enough, is extremely complex, 
tightly organized, slightly impenetrable, and very disorganized or very confusing in its order of the Latin words. So labyrinthine. Yes, it is exactly that. And I mean, this is a very standard Latin poetry trick to make the words and the feel of the grammar and everything reflect the content. Right. And Catullus is hardly the poet to pass that opportunity up. Okay, so that's the story. And then um, she stands there remembering all of this, and then she in screams in grief and then she there's a long speech so somehow this description of this coverlet ends ends up involving a big long speech so you were false to me you betrayed me theseus did you not lure me from my family altars leave me on this bare shore and sail off slighting not only me but the gods you take home a freight of broken promises and my curse it goes on and on one line that i'm just going to read out because it's an inversion of the standard line in latin and greek poetry From now on, let no woman put her trust in a man's vows or a man's wheedling speeches. For when the lustful mood grips them, they're bold with promises, generous with guarantees. But once their itch is satisfied, they shrug off words they don't mind dishonesty. Which, um, there's a a very standard saying, never trust in a woman's words and never trust in a lover's words. A lover will always break their promises. So I just wanted to point that out because she's turning it on its head. Mm. This is interesting to include in a wedding context. Well, indeed. So I can go on on that topic, and I will in a moment. But I wanted to just bring that up. And her speech is fabulous on all sorts of levels. For instance, she talks about how she betrays her brother for him. Mm. Who's her brother? The Minotaur. Yeah. So brotherly ties are not normally Mm. what one thinks of when you think of the monster. But she Mm. phrases it it as, I betrayed my father. I betrayed my brother. I led my brother's blood is on my hands. Mm -hmm. Which, when you think of the Minotaur, is, you know, so there's a, an obvious almost joke in there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she goes on and on, and she makes a long rhetorical speech that is full of all sorts of references to other people like Medea and stuff like that. And Medea abandoned by Jason. There's a very strong reference here to Medea abandoned by Jason, even though Jason, remember, is on the Argonaut. Jason comes after Ariadne in myth, since Jason and the Argonauts was Peleus. Right. who right, Peleus right. was going right. So she she acts like Medea in the Euripides play of Medea, Abandoned by Jason, which is before her in literary time, but after her in mythological time. It's all very complex and highly clever and just awesome. But anyway, I won't go on, but she goes on and on and on. She talks about her curse that he he has been forgetful of her. She curses him with forgetfulness. And what is he He most famously forgetful about? He forgets to change the sails. He forgets to change the sails. So this in this in this version is made to be a direct response. Essentially, he forgetful of her is then forgetful to change the sails to the white sails when he returns, and his father kills himself in grief. So it is just retribution in this version for his neglect of her. And then the description of the art on the coverlet ends. Unfortunately, there's a section missing from our manuscript. We only have this in one manuscript, and there's a section that's lost because we have just the introduction saying that Bacchus, or Dionysus, Mm. is coming and falls in love with her, or sees her, and then there's missing lines. Mm. And then at the end, all we see is a description of his procession, and we assume that he that the myth is that he, he takes her up and marries her and eventually turns her into stars. But it's missing, unfortunately, from our version. But the whole description ends with such were the figures gorgeously embroidered on the quilt that draped and clasped the marriage bed of Peleus and Thetis. And then the story moves out again. The guests, having looked at that, leave and the gods come. And then there's a big, long story. I am going to talk about all the content of this, but I just want to to cover the end of it. The rest of the poem then focuses on the marriage after, you know, the wedding feast when the gods come because it's Peleus and Thetis and Thetis is a goddess. So after the mortals have left... The gods come as guests Mm -hmm. and they are entertained by the song of the fates. So the three fates are guests and they sing a song. So the last section of the poem is the song of the fates. And what they do is they prophesy about what will come of this marriage. They, in other words, they sing about Achilles because Achilles is what will come of this marriage. But I want to describe the fates because this is going to come up. You talked about in the video about textiles and wool working right. in myth and you don't mention the fates so they're not mentioned by names here just the fates the fates with palsy gestures began to utter their prophetic chant 
pale draped from trembling head to foot in robes red hemmed at the ankle with red fillets tied round their white heads they solemnly pursued their sempiternal occupation left hand holding the wool wrapped distaff right hand lightly drawing the filaments out and fingers upturned shaping them into thread then thumb tw down twirling the spindle balanced on its rounded whirl meanwhile stripping the wool clean with their teeth so that the tufts that made the yarn uneven clung to their granny lips and all the time neat osier baskets at their feet kept safe the fluffy gleamy masses of crude fleece they as they worked the wool pitched high their voices in a rhapsodic song of destiny words that time has no power to prove a lie and then they sing about the marriage and then about achilles the mm -hmm. child who will be born and there's a chorus to their song run spindles draw the thread run spindles run so as they sing they sing to their thread that they're spinning but of course that thread is the thread of fate right it's not just wool it's the thread of fate so this double meaning of this chorus which is that this is the fate this is fated this mm -hmm. is how the fates will go and the story starts off as sort of being brides and bridegrooms and then achilles is born ignorant of fear no hero will dare to confront him Mothers at gravesides with gray hair unbound and uncombed will acknowledge his renowned heroic exploits as their weak fists pound old woman's breasts because the son is dead. So for just as at reaping time the farmer wields his scythe blade, slashing at the yellow fields till the dense stalks lie flat in the hot sun, so shall Achilles with his steel destroy the bodies of the warriors of Troy. He will make the Hellespont choking with heaped corpses turn blood red and blood warm to the depths with men he's killed. After his death, his funeral will be crowned with the white limbs of the sacrificial maid Polyxena when his ghost is duly paid. The girl Polyxena is, was supposed to marry him, is sacrificed to his shade, is killed to, for him. And then it's a description of her like a beast. She'll take the stroke of the two-edged polax crouching on her knees and pitch to the ground a trunk without a head. Now, join loving hearts in your coveted union. <laughs> Let him, contented in his vow, receive his goddess wife. Let her be led straight to her eager waiting husband now. I think I just got whiplash. Yeah, no, <laughs> indeed. The thread is spun, run, spindles, draw the thread, run, spindles, run. Such was the happiness the fates divinely prompted foretold for Peleus long ago. And then he ends with a saying, for that was a time when the gods came to the homes of mortal men back in the golden age, the heroic age. Now the earth grew deep ingrained with sin and covetous men turned justice out of doors brothers hand plunged hands in the blood of brothers children ceased mourning for their parents fathers hankered for a son's death more freely to enjoy some fresh young blossom as a second wife and vicious mothers seduced innocent boys in blasphemous outrage of the household gods till right and wrong virtue and vice all weltering in mad perversity we so estranged and horrified the minds of the good gods that they no longer condescend to join men's feasts and festivals or care to endure the touch of our too glaring light of day the end <laughs> <laughs> sorry I, I know i read a lot of that but i mean there's just so much good stuff in there but i wanted to, to read enough that we could talk about it a little bit right so yes first of all your observation what on earth is this doing in a wedding <laughs> feast and i mean a big part of the complexity of this poem is how utterly inappropriate every element of it is to any kind of happy marriage mm -hmm. but of course the marriage of peleus and thetis is it happy no Thetis soon leaves Peleus because she doesn't like, she doesn't want to be married to a mortal in the first place. She's married to a mortal because Zeus doesn't want her to marry any god because there's a prophecy her son will be greater than his father. Ah. So she's forced to marry a mortal, so she doesn't want to. She leaves soon after, and in some versions of the story after, he's interrupted her while she's trying to make Achilles immortal because he thinks she's burning him because she dips him in the fire. That's probably a late story, but still, for various reasons, at least by the time Catullus is dealing with the story, they definitely had an unhappy marriage. They only have one child. It's Achilles, doomed to die early. Right. And also doomed, as the fates make very clear, to be the scourge of men, to kill and kill and kill again, to be the essence of a horrific man killer. Yes, a great hero, but a very bloody and famed for his anger and his unrelenting anger. So the whole poem is sort of focused on bad weddings and bad marriages hmm. and bad relationships. And in that then is the reason why the inset narrative, the ekphrasis, is of Ariadne and Theseus. Right. Because you think about Ariadne and Theseus, are they a good relationship? Not only is Ariadne and Theseus obviously a bad relationship in that he abandons her, the rest of that myth is full of bad relationships. 
Pacifae. Pacifae's love affair is with a bull, bull and yeah. produces a mm-hmm. monster. Mm-hmm. After Theseus gets home, he's going to end up with Ariadne's sister after multiple other adventures with And I have some questions Amazons about that. that we'll yeah, we'll come yeah. to that. But he's going to end up with Ariadne's sister eventually, who will fall in love with her stepson and cause the death of him and kill herself. The House of Crete is renowned for the women's problems with sexuality, shall we say. Hmm. And Ariadne, therefore, is one of those. So the story is filled with these sort of really problematic images of marriage. And Theseus and Ariadne stand as that. So that's one element. I wanted to show how this myth is transformed and used by Catullus in a poem that has epic elements to it, but is in very many ways not really epic. But what he's doing is he's doing the same thing he does in the larger story of Peleus and Thetis and Achilles, using something that is heroic myth, but subverting it or undercutting it and undercutting its heroism. And in particular, but he does this by taking the female perspective on it. And he does this repeatedly. Catullus is very interesting for his use of gender and his use of gendered perspective, taking sort of feminine perspectives on things. So here it is Ariadne who says, Theseus, you are a crap hero. I'm the one who did everything for you. And you're forgetful and cruel and hard hearted. So she's undercutting that heroic sort of ethos, the the idea of the heroic ideal. And we get the discarded female being centered on and saying Theseus isn't so great. And in fact, she is able to influence him with her curse when she asks uh, Jupiter or Zeus to help her and curse him. And he ends up being cursed because of it. And that's um, a, a really interesting take on the whole story. And that's one of the reasons I love it is because it's it recenters the narrative on a different element. And the same thing happens with the fates. It's the story is recentered on a different outside perspective instead of on Achilles as your centered mm-hmm. perspective in the Iliad. Mm-hmm. You instead have the fates who have this external view of it. Right. And who do they really bring out? They bring out the old mothers beating their breasts and Polyxena sacrificed on Achilles altar. Right. So it's a refocalizing of the narrative. Mm. Uh, which is one of the things that's amazing about the way Catullus approaches these things. I'm not trying to suggest he's you know, some proto-feminist or anything like <laughs> it, because he's not. But what he is doing is questioning the sort of standard perspective on these stories right. and rejigging them. And that has a lot to do with uh, larger elements of his poetic program that I'm not going to get into here, about uh, recentering on erotic stories, for instance, rather than military glory. But nonetheless, it's a really interesting approach to it. And what that ends up doing is meaning that poem is filled with images of weaving and textiles and feminine elements, because that's Mm -hmm. part of the Mm -hmm. narrative thread. And this element of the clue, it's not obviously a detective clue, but there is this idea that a thread is what joins it all, that this textile and weaving and spinning is what joins it all Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And we definitely see the power of the textile imagery used really explicitly in that fates image where they're described in such detail in their spinning. And then that is really important metaphorically throughout their story as well. And it's you know, no coincidence that the whole story of Ariadne is on a coverlet. It's an embroidered image. Right. Normally a crassus, that is the description of a work of art within a, an epic setting in particular, the famous one is the shield of Achilles. Right. And there's a shield of Heracles and there's, there's the shield of Aeneid later in, in Virgil. But here it's not a shield, it's a bedspread, a purple marriage bedspread. Right. So again, this shift in emphasis, shift in perspective from the heroic to the erotic mm. and the masculine to the feminine. Okay, I could talk about that poem for another four hours, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of what I wanted to bring out. I wanted to bring out the way the story is transformed into this different kind of approach right. in Catullus. And Catullus is writing sort of in the 50s, probably, B.C., just to center ourselves in time. Right. And I wanted to move on to Ovid. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to give the chronology there so that we can say Ovid is two generations, let's say, poetic generations later. And Ovid, by the way, writes in particular, (laughs) but in particular, he comes to this myth in a work called the Heroides, which Mm -hmm. are letters from the heroic women. Mm Mm-hmm. The women, um, the in, women heroic in hero. Myth. Yeah, heroides literally means heroic women, I guess. 
Yeah. I mean, as much as it means anything Anything. literally. Yeah. 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 And so they're, they're basically letters written by the girlfriends of heroes (laughs) heroes <laughs> yeah the, i mean there's there's different they're the sisters or the wives, the wives or yeah. the, the women girlfriends or to... i don't know if there's any mothers i think they're all sisters or wives mm-hmm. or lovers anyway yeah yeah of of heroic men heroic of various men. types and so one of the letters is ariadne writing to theseus after being she's abandoned after yeah. being abandoned And in Ovid's version of this, by the way, he also has a line that kind of echoes that idea of, I betrayed my brother. Right. Yeah. Ovid would love it even, I mean, Catullus loves the kind of perversity of that Mm -hmm. line, but Ovid revels in that stuff. That is, that's his bread and butter. Right. Yeah. So I I was immediately interested in what word was the stand-in for clue Mm -hmm. um, that that Chaucer was using later on. The original word word. that Chaucer was using clue to stand in for, please. (laughs) Well, then we have to go back to Greek. Yeah, okay, details. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So in Catullus, it's philum. Yes. And it's phila, so in the plural, in Ovid. Right. So threads. And I don't know if there's any, you know, kind of usage... There's a very, I I couldn't say, I will say that in standardly, we talk about poetic plurals for singular. That's a very common poetic thing to use plurals for singular, especially with neuters, but also with others. So I I mean, there might be, but there's Mm. every possibility. It it doesn't mean anything particular. So this word philum, by the way, um, comes into English as like filament. Mm -hmm. So a thread and interestingly file. Oh yeah. Because it makes it thinner. No, not that file. Not the file oh, as okay. in to file like something. Not a nail file. Not a nail file. Not that file. The other kind of file, like a file folder. Oh, okay. And this is a really weird etymology. It has to do with the fact that files or documents mm-hmm. were originally sort of strung up on a line. Oh, I think I vaguely remember hearing about this. It's really weird, and I, I I have trouble picturing this in my mind. So if anyone knows of a you know an image of this, I'd like mm-hmm. to kind of see it. But basically, it's the idea of stringing up important documents so yeah. that they're close at hand on wires. And I think close at hand, and I think also maybe protected from things like rats eating them. Could be, yeah. But that might have been in a weird historical romance I read. So I don't know if that's real. <laughs> they are basically but, hanging like yeah, that. So that I mean, is the it, it idea. They're suspended it would be that from two be, points. Yeah, it would be a, that they would be out of reach of other of things because, of, of things, course, yeah. documents are vulnerable, especially when they're made out of skin. Yeah. They are vulnerable to being eaten by insects and animals and things like that. So maybe maybe that's true, but I have no citation for it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the word file comes from. Okay. It was, that is, it was yeah, that interesting is interesting. Little byway. But it ties back nicely, I suppose, into the whole fingerprint thing in case your fingerprints are kept on file right by the way that's why it's the the phrase is on file on a string in file not in a file but on a file or upon a file in earlier usage Usage. right okay but getting back to ovid ovid in particular stresses the danger of abandonment it's not so much that she feels emotionally suffering it's the fact she what she really seems to stress in ovid's version is that she's at risk Yes. She's given up this safety yes. of, you know, being the daughter of a king and That's in Catullus as well. I didn't I didn't mm. emphasize that. I mean her her speech in Catullus is quite long. So I didn't right. want to read it all. Right, right, right. But it is quite long. But yeah, no, she says, you know, I that's the point about having a, uh, betrayed her father and her brother. She right. cannot go back to She them. can't go back. No. She's abandoned yeah. and a Greek or Roman woman who's no longer got the safety of her relatives, her male relatives, mm. if she doesn't have a husband she's in serious trouble. Right. So, you know, that is that is definitely an undercurrent there too. But I can imagine Ovid develops it more rhetorically because he, that's what he does. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Chaucer's version, he's, one of his sources is indeed the Heroides, but it he tells the whole narrative. It's not just the, you know, that moment yeah. of speech yeah. or, or whatever. So he tells the whole story, okay. um, a story which would be no doubt less familiar to a 14th century English right. audience than, than Ovid's audience. Yeah. But in Chaucer's version, the emphasis is really on the oath that Theseus makes right. to Ariadne that he promises, right. you know, to that he will marry her and take her with him. And, and then he breaks it. Yeah. And he breaks it. And so Chaucer really condemns him as a kind of an oath breaker. Right. And there's seeds of that in, you know, Catullus. Mm-hmm. But the Ariadne of Catullus wavers between calling him immemor, unremembering, forgetful, 
and accusing him of more directly actually. And that is a sort of a, a, a feature of the myth is the question is, is he forgetful or, mm. and because there's multiple versions of his leaving her where he literally forgets. Right. And as you, as you reference in the video where he literally is, is deceived by a God and forgets or where he deliberately sneaks away. Right. There's, there's different versions of it. But so for Chaucer, it's, it's a deliberate betrayal. Yes. It's a deliberate betrayal. And he makes no mention of being led away yeah, and all of that. Right. Now, here I come to one of the sort of questions that I have about different versions okay. of the myth. So in Chaucer, and here's where I can't remember if I was sort of cheating a little bit or if I got it slightly wrong, that speech is not actually Ariadne's speech. Oh. It's Phaedra's speech. So Phaedra comes up with the idea oh, of yeah, I don't using remember. the string. I don't remember now because Clue, we, we did that a couple... That was... And was that in our first year? It was two years ago two now. Two years about, ago, yeah. yeah. So I don't remember. But I think we thought it was Ariadne, so I don't know Quite if you possibly. just... Or maybe you, you told me it was Ariadne. Yeah. I just believed because I'm so <laughs> trusting. When a man tells me things, I just believe him. <laughs> well, it was it was Phaedra talking to Ariadne. You know, Phaedra basically, Ariadne, Ariadne says, we need to save him. What do we do? So Phaedra... Phaedra says, Ariadne's well, here's my sister. idea. Yeah. yeah. Phaedra, Ariadne's sister, says, well, here's what we can do. Right. Okay. In some versions of the myth, as I gather, it's actually Daedalus, the constructor of the labyrinth, yes. who gives, who her, gives the, her the, the idea. Plan. Mm -hmm. That is in some versions. And I by no means know all of the versions because right. there are multiple, multiple versions, versions of the story. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't tell you who says that or which version it comes in. Hmm. It, it's not in Catullus, but then Catullus is focusing so strongly on Ariadne. It makes no sense to bring Daedalus in. Right. Well, as Chaucer has it, Theseus takes away not only Ariadne, but Phaedra as well when they flee. Okay. Trying to explain how the heck he ends up marrying or with them sequentially. Yes. And right. basically what he does is he just suddenly decides he likes Phaedra better. And abandons, and abandons Ariadne. Ariadne ah, interesting. In order to run off with Phaedra. Right. Okay. Now, I don't know where Chaucer's getting this from, if this is his own idea, if he's basing this on, on Yeah, I can't a say. I know that, you know, the stories of Theseus, much like the stories of Heracles, don't make logical, chronological sense. Myth doesn't mm. originally, but then as people start writing myth down, they try to make it all reconcile and be rational. Right. And there's problems with the chronology of Theseus because he ends up, he has a lot of women. Hmm. So in many versions of the story, at least, the story of Ariadne and the Minotaur is right at the beginning, right? He arrives in Athens, tells his father, he's his father, is recognized, and almost immediately goes off and does the Minotaur, right. which means it's the first thing he does. He then abandons Ariadne. He then has a number of adventures, including going off and fighting against the Amazons, where he marries, let's say, <laughs> Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons, right. who comes back with him to Athens for a little while and bears him the son, Hippolytus. Right. And Hippolytus is important later. Then he marries Phaedra. And it's important that he marries Hippolyta first so that he can produce the son, Hippolytus, mm -hmm. who then has to be essentially grown. He has to be, you know, 17, 18 right. or something, because when he marries Phaedra or soon after he marries her at some point, she falls in love with Hippolytus. Right. And then there's the whole story of that where he refuses her and she hangs herself and leaves a suicide note saying that he'd raped her. And then Theseus curses Hippolytus and his father Poseidon, because it turns out he has two fathers, but let's not get into that, causes Hippolytus to be killed by his horses. And then Theseus realizes he's made a horrible, horrible mistake and is very sad. And by the way, one of the heroides is Phaedra. Is Phaedra. Yeah, absolutely. Writing to Hippolytus. Hippolytus. And try I know that one's a really spectacularly bizarre one too, where she's trying to justify her love to him. It's great. That is Ovid at his most rhetorical, really. But anyway, so in that sequence of events, he can't take Ariadne and Phaedra at the same time. Right. Because there has to be Hippolyta in between. Right. And Hippolytus has to be born and grow up. That said, after he'd come to Minos, killed the Minotaur, and stolen Ariadne, why on earth would <laughs> Minos send his other daughter, Phaedra, to marry? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any versions that try to rationalize it particularly. But then I don't, I've never studied this myth in detail. So there may be stuff about right. it. But it doesn't make any logical sense. Also, somewhere along the way, by the way, he also kidnaps Helen. 
when she's about <laughs> 10, 10 to, 10 to 12, because he and his his friend Pirithuas decide that they're both sons of gods, so they should definitely have daughters of gods as their wives. Right. So that he kidnaps Helen for himself, but she's too young to marry, so he's going to, like, I don't know, keep her in the palace for a while. And then her brothers... Castor and Pollux come to bring her back and threaten to attack the city, and he gives her back. So basically, your famous line from the uh, video, jerk, is highly, highly applicable. Yes. Then Pirithuis says, I want a daughter of a god too. Uh, how about Persephone? So they go to the underworld to try to get her. Oh boy. <laughs> and Theseus, and they're trapped in the underworld because obviously that fails. And eventually, Heracles, when he's down in the underworld getting Kerberos... Mm. The dog that guards the underworld as one of his labors sees Theseus and Pirithuis and grabs Theseus. They're stuck onto chairs. Their bums are stuck to chairs. <laughs> and he grabs Theseus and pulls Theseus off of his chair, ripping parts of his bums away, which is why Athenians are so slim hipped, goes the myth. <laughs> But when, when he tries to do the same for Pirith Pirithuis, there's an earthquake and there's a sort of, no, oh, you can't do that. Theseus is allowed, but Pirithuis isn't allowed. And so Pirithuis is trapped in the underworld, but Theseus comes back up. Where that falls in his various marriages is not clear. <laughs> so yeah, Theseus has many marital adventures, none of which go well. And they don't make any sense. Mm. Like there's no logic to it at all. Why someone hasn't made a good movie of this, I don't know. They've made a really bad movie of Theseus, <laughs> if that's any help. There's a movie called Immortals, or The Immortals, or Immortal. Anyway, don't watch it. It's awful. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Theseus, too. There's a man who wears a bullhead mask. Like, it's just awful. But anyway, yeah. So, it, you know, it's, it's astonishing. Um, well, uh, in fact, a friend of ours, Amelia Carosella, has written a, a number of books. Uh, Daughter of a Thousand Years is, and By Helen's Hand are about Helen and Theseus and the relationship between Helen and Theseus. And mm. she sort of does its historical romance. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gets into some of the, trying to rationalize some of these stories and the way they all right. work. And it's a, it's an admirable attempt. I will say that I'm not completely convinced by the rationalization of it, though the books are really good, just because the myth is so crazy. Because myth is crazy. <laughs> but anyway. A quick correction from the future. Amelia Caracella's books about Helen are Helen of Sparta and By Helen's Hand. So I just thought it was interesting that Chaucer casts it as leaving Ariadne for another woman specifically. Yes. Yeah, no, that which is a different motivation mm -hmm. certainly than we have in the others. And definitely, you know, in Chaucer's sort of interest in the whole romantic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a whole different conception of romance. Romance and mm -hmm. so forth. But uh, it, it made me think that this might be one of the reasons why Ariadne Oliver is Agatha Christie's a, Ariadne Agatha, Oliver. Yeah. Is a stand in for Agatha Christie, not only because of the clue. Mm -hmm. kind of connection, yeah. but also because of this sort of infidelity ah, because, because of, of Agatha Christie's, Christie's life. life. So her husband, her first husband, Archie Christie, left her for his, his mistress. Right. And this sparked off her disappearance. Yes. Never Which I'll come back to. Discussed, but, but yeah. Never fully discussed. But she disappeared for about a week or so. Mm -hmm. And she had some kind of mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if she created the character Ariadne Oliver using the name as a kind of reference to the infidelity. Theseus. Theseus. I'd, I'd have to check the chronology his, of all of that, but well, probably. I checked the chronology. Oh, so Ariadne Oliver appears in 1930 something or other okay, for, so for the first time. After a while. Which yeah. is after her husband. After uh, that after marriage Ag broke down. Agatha yeah. Christie's husband left her. Right. So... Okay. It, it yeah. fits. Uh, it fits. No, you're right. You're right. It does. <laughs> I mean, the Ariadne for the clue is the obvious connection. Yes. But you're right. That's not a bad secondary reason. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the, I don't know if it's so much of a criticism or one of the observations that's often made about Chaucer's telling of this story mm -hmm. is that the treatment is so abrupt and Theseus is promising his undying love mm -hmm. to, to Ariadne is so quick Right. That it sort of undercuts any feeling of pathos that you might have for the story. It's it's almost comic. It just moves too fast. It He's just like, moves too fast to be believable. He sets eyes on her, suddenly promises everything, yeah. and then is abandoning just, her the next moment. He, and you get the almost the sense that he's just saying whatever he, need, he needs right. to say to save his life. You, so you get no emotional sense of you don't, emotional yeah. truth, right? And so she, uh, Ariadne, appears almost just sort of um, pathetic mm, right. more than anything else. Right. 
Be that as as it may, though, it can't be stressed enough the importance of Chaucer in terms of how this word clue. Yeah, I mean, it is really an interesting example of Mm -hmm. being able to trace it back to essentially one story, one introduction of the word that becomes what we would think of as a really, really common word. Basic word, yeah. yeah. So so I wanted, there's so many details about the whole fingerprinting story mm-hmm. that I didn't have time to, to really get into. Right. But of course, interest in fingerprints goes way back. I mean, the, the Chinese were apparently using fingerprints as signatures on contracts 2,000 years ago. Right. I think the Wikipedia entry on fingerprinting mentions various other ancient uses of fingerprints for one purpose or another. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the sort of modern scientific interest in fingerprinting, Mm -hmm. there's actually an 18th century German scientist, uh, J.C. Mayer, who realized the uniqueness of fingerprinting and started studying them. But purely out of scientific interest, he Mm -hmm. never suggested any practical application for this fact. Similarly, in the 19th century, early 19th century, there was a Czech anatomy professor, Jan Evangelista Purkine. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that in any way correct, because I do not know anything about the Czech language. I can say nothing one way or the other about it. (laughs) But he also was, you know, studying fingerprinting or, or fingerprints, but out of a purely scientific interest. So what Herschel and Falls and, and, mm-hmm. and the others really contributed was the sort of practical application of... The idea of using it as an identification. An identification. Rather than just... For various noticing, purposes, yeah. whether whether that be you know, criminal or not, detection yeah. or... So Herschel's interest was, was purely for contract purposes mm-hmm. right. because there was a big problem with people denying their signatures. Right. Signing so, a contract and then saying, no, it, oh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the fingerprint was a way of hopefully getting around that problem. But one of the kind of triggers to why it was so important to find better ways of identifying people for criminal reasons was the increase of travel and urbanization in the 19th century. Right. People moving away from the communities in which they were known so well that there was never any question of identification. So when you were a repeat offender, which triggered harsher fines, you would be automatically recognized Right. Earlier in, a, in, a small on, in a small community. Yeah. Yeah. But with people moving around more, they got around this sort of local knowledge. And so there was this need for a, a not way just attribute, not so not just fingerprints to attribute a crime, like just no, know yeah. who it was. But just to track criminals. To be able to say, hey, this is the seventh time yeah. you've broken and entered, this time you, you're going away for life or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so this is what's behind not only fingerprinting, but another method of that was sort of floating around at the time, an, an alternate method of identifying mm-hmm. individuals called anthropometry, <laughs> which uh-huh. has to do with basically measuring the body and the dimensions right, okay. of the body and the face and so forth. Right. And this was pioneered by Alphonse Bertillon, a French... I know that name. Why do I know that name? Bertillon? Bertillon. Well, this is the interesting thing. So one of the one of the kind of themes of that video yeah. was the sort of interchange between fiction and right, right. and reality, real life. Yeah. Real life. Yeah. And so you may have heard of the name Bertillon in fiction, yeah. in detective fiction, because the Sherlock Holmes stories mentions him twice. Okay, that might be why. So I'm that might more be more likely why. for me to know it from fiction than it is from real life. Yeah. <laughs> Just knowing me. <laughs> so uh, Holmes is is at one point characterized as being the second most yeah, that knowledgeable must be where expert. I know the name from. That must be uh, yeah. second only to Bertillon in terms of right. anthropometry. Right. Okay. And similarly, Locard of the Locard Exchange Principle right. uh, was uh, referred to as the Sherlock Holmes of France. <laughs> so there's this interesting yeah, kind of interplay forth, between yeah. fiction and and real life detectives mm-hmm. at the time. That, of course, works also onward with fiction and fiction because Hercule Poirot references, references Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, Holmes as well. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, fingerprinting is is really one of the, the sort of core bits of that video. And one of the things that I was quite kind of pleased with myself about, which is not evident from just hearing the, the voiceover, but, you know, seeing the video, right. is the kind of visual parallel between the labyrinthine curves and ridges of the fingerprint right. and the labyrinth itself yeah. in the um, Theseus story. Right. That they're visually similar. Visually similar. Yeah. So, you know, do 
do watch the video. Uh, I'm quite proud of that, uh, the way that it was visually realized. Right. One other note, little footnote that I should make, by the way, about the word clue is that it's also used to refer to a part of a sail. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm interested in sailing technology, mm -hmm. obviously. Check um, out Paddle Your Own Canoe, indeed. another video on the channel <laughs> for sailing technology and its relationship to literature through the ages. <laughs> But yes, there's the word, I think it's usually spelled clue. With an E-W. With an E-W. Meaning? It's part of the sail. Itself? Okay. Yeah. I don't know anything about sailing technology. <laughs> I will say, it's though. the corner where the, the leech and foot connect is called the clue. Um, oh, well, that the, completely explains On the fore and aft sail. Oh, well, then. <laughs> so someone who knows about sails. Will understand what you more, just said. <laughs> in more detail than we do. Though um, we can connect we'll clue that, but... and sails in the story of Theseus. Yes. Who followed Follow... a clue, but then forgot to change his sails. Yes. Yes. So there's a connection there's there. There's a nice connection there. And that kind of brings us back to the question of textiles and weaving and the use of those kinds of elements in myth, right? Right. So, of course, I mentioned various other mythological references to weaving, mm -hmm. um, the Fates, Penelope, Ari as well as Ariadne. Mm -hmm. But some other interesting ones, of course, are Athena. Yes. yes. So Athena, you know, who is the goddess of military strategy when it applies to men, but mm -hmm. when it applies to women, I guess, is more in terms of the sort of things that women can be cunning at, I guess. Yes. There's a lot of work done on what how Athena works and cunning. Mm -hmm. But Athena is the goddess of intelligence. Right. And intelligence as worked out in many different ways. Weaving being, yes, the feminine version of it. Military strategy being the male version of it. Yeah, for sure. And she is connected to the story of Ariadne in some versions. She's the one yeah. that leads Theseus away. That's in her role as supporter of male heroes. Male and heroes. of course, Theseus being the hero of Athens. She right. has a particular connection to, but she's generally a supporter of male heroes. Athena is not sympathetic to women in myth. She repeatedly comes down against their interest. So it would not be out of character at all for her to take Theseus aside and abandon Ariadne. And the other, I suppose, the, the other major kind of weaving myth that Athena is attached to is the Arachne yeah. story. In which Arachne is a mortal who is very, very good at weaving. So good, in fact, that people say she's better than Athena. And in the end, she ends up challenging Athena to a weaving contest and more importantly, winning that contest, or at least it's never brought to judgment. But Athena weaves great images of the gods. Arachne weaves great images of all the most disgraceful things the gods have ever done. And Athena is so insulted by this that and so upset by the fact that Arachne is quite probably outdoing her that she turns Arachne into a spider and says, <laughs> go ahead weaver. and weave as much as you want to weave. <laughs> Never be better than the gods at what the gods do. Right. That story, of course, is told in its greatest detail by Ovid in the Metamorphoses. Right. Yes. And in other connections, another weaving story that's told by Chaucer in The Legend of Good Women mm -hmm. is the story of Procne and Philomela. Right. Yes. So in this story, Philomela is visiting her sister, Procne, who is married to Tereus mm -hmm. and is raped by Tereus. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I think the story basically goes that Tereus goes to pick her up from her home okay. to bring her, bring her to visit her, her sister and rapes her on the voyage and therefore never actually brings her to see her sister. So okay. she and secretes her in a cottage in, a, in right. the forest uh, as his essentially sexual assault victim and says to his wife, oh, she died on the voyage. Right. Well, to further hide his crime, he cuts out her tongue mm -hmm. so that she can never tell the story. Yeah. And what she does to convey the message is weaves it into a tapestry or mm -hmm. whatever. And sends that to her sister, mm -hmm. who sees it. And then to punish her husband, takes her children, cuts them up and serves them to him as a meal. <laughs> because that is a thing people do in myth. And once he has eaten a fair amount of it, brings their head and hands to show him what he has done. she has done, along with her sister. And then since this is told in Ovid's Metamorphoses, right. they're all turned into birds. <laughs> <laughs> Every story in the Metamorphoses obviously has to end with a metamorphosis. Right. So it's another interesting mm -hmm. connection 
in Chaucer, you know, to since yes, Chaucer it involves weaving it, and yeah, and it yeah. involves weaving. And it's it is an interesting story because it's a story about storytelling. Yes, you know, and all of these stories about storytelling. One of the other people that you didn't mention who weaves is Helen. Yes, right. Helen in the Iliad weaves. She's found weaving and she weaves. Do you know what she weaves? No, actually, I don't. She weaves the story of the Iliad. Oh, it specifically says in the so Iliad that she is weaving the story of her abduction and the war huh. into the tapestries she's weaving. And since weaving is a really, really common metaphor for poetry... And for creation of poetry, right. she is essentially doing... She's trying to create her fame. She is creating her story. She is telling her own story. She is doing what a poet does when he weaves words. She is weaving her story and the story of her own, yeah, as you say, fame. So, yeah, it's a very... <laughs> I mean, to think that that's in the Iliad, which we think of as so sort of oral and mm -hmm. not rich, to think that that level of meta-poetics mm -hmm. is happening mm -hmm. in the Iliad. And so she weaves that story while Penelope is weaving and unpicking the story of, right. as it were, metaphorically, her chastity. Right. Helen is telling the story of her unchastity. And, right, you know, right. so, I mean, it's a nice it parallel. is, it's an amazingly wonderful parallel, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Well, speaking of communication through, through textiles. textiles, this leads me into the next topic that I wanted to, to come to, which is the idea of knitting code. Right. Right. So much more modern, moving more, more quickly modern. into the modern world. Yes. Knitting, for the record, not an ancient technique. No. Not even an early medieval technique. It's a late, med it's a middle medieval technique. Knitting is in some ways surprisingly recent right. in the span of human textile creation. But anyway, go on. So during World War II, the sending of knitting patterns was banned mm -hmm. because of fear that it could be used to encode messages. Because it was so clearly a code. <laughs> mm -hmm. But indeed, in Belgium, the movements of trains were recorded in knitting. So this is not so it wasn't far outlandish yeah. a fear. But of course, the other major literary example that you know predates this of knitting records mm -hmm. is from Tale of Two Cities. Yes, uh, Madame, Madame Defarge, Defarge, who knits the names of the condemned yes. at the guillotine into her scarf, I guess. It's not really clear large knitted pattern but yeah she's <laughs> yes. knitting the names and recording them as but it's as a sort of ghoulish record mm -hmm. of, of the dead i don't know if there's any historical actuality to, to that, to that no. though i well i do think there were tricoteurs, tricoteurs there were people who sat and knitted, knitted while they watched it yeah but i don't know i think the detail of knitting the names, the names in is, may is be dickensian fictional yeah but i i can't swear to that mm -hmm. Now, there is a sort of popular belief that Aaron sweaters were right. used to identify the bodies of drowned fishermen. The idea being that wives knit specific patterns for their husbands so that if they washed up on the shore, you could tell them by their yeah. sweaters. This doesn't actually, unfortunately, seem to be true. Yeah. It seems to be traced back to a play by John Millington Singh named Riders to the Sea, mm -hmm. in which someone's body is identified from a drop stitch on a stocking or something like that. Right. So the wife says, oh, I, those stockings, I remember, I remember those. those. I remember those. I made those. Yeah. I made that mistake and I notice it. Yeah. Which is not the same as deliberately knitting, as as it were, ID into yeah, the sweater. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that nobody's ever been identified by a sweater, but of course, people are <laughs> identified by their clothing. Yes. Yeah. But that it was not the purpose of the Aaron patterns. And so, finally, we come to Agatha Christie herself. Back to her. Back yeah. to her. And her sort of connections. So, I mentioned her disappearance. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who it may surprise you to hear was quite avid about spiritualism. Yes. Popular you've talked at the about time. That. I've talked about this in other videos, yeah. but he apparently hired a spiritualist to track Agatha Christie down. What is interesting about that is one doesn't remember that they overlapped. Yes. You know, right. I think that that is something that is hard to mm -hmm. keep in mind, that they overlapped as active writers. Yeah. He was writing into the 1920s. And she started in the, in early, the early 20s or the late? It was I think very she was early writing b even before that, but I think her detective fiction 
maybe dates from the early 1920s. Maybe 1920 or yeah. so. Yeah. I mean, it is set. Well, it's actually the first work she did was set during the, wa- the First war. World yeah. War. Mm-hmm. But of course, because she writes into the 60s, yes, you don't remember that her earliest stuff is that early. Yeah. And also, of course, Conan Doyle is associated so strongly with the turn of the century the that Victorian he forgets that period, he yeah. goes he, into the Edwardian. Yeah. So he hired a spiritualist to try to track her down. Yes. Interesting. And another famous writer, detective fiction writer, Dorothy L. Sayers, Mm -hmm. was also a friend of Christie. Right. um, And she also helped with the, the search. Oh, that is interesting. I didn't know that either. And the one of the interesting things that I just recently found out about Christie and Sayers is that they were both members of what was called the Detection Club. A group of writers, yeah. detective fiction writers, who sort of and chatted. met and chatted and talked about I think about I knew a bit about that, but I'd forgotten it. I'd forgotten that because I love Sayers as well. And she is she's not massively different than Christie in some ways, but in other ways, they're very different in style. But basically, they both come down to whodunits. Mm-hmm. I had forgotten that they had that strong connection. Well, this group apparently kind of co-wrote a work called The Floating Admiral, in which each author sort of contributed a solution to the mystery. And I really want to read this now. Yeah, why have I never read that? I don't know. <laughs> this is astonishing to me. <laughs> okay, that is our next task. Yes. But one of the interesting things about this group is that one of their fundamental principles is that all of their stories should be, shouldn't cheat, basically. right. 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 And it's written into the, the club's oath, which I want to read because okay. it's quite fun. Do you promise that your detectives shall well and truly detect the crimes presented to them using those wits which it may please you to bestow upon them and not placing reliance on nor making use of divine revelation, feminine intuition, <laughs> mumbo jumbo, jiggery pokery, coincidence or act of God? Right. And that feminine, feminine intuition, intuition is particularly interesting because Ariadne Oliver is always claiming to have feminine intuition. Yes, yes. And Hercule is often... Now, he makes the point that what you call feminine intuition is often noticing something without noticing you've noticed it. Right, yes. So he, it's a sort of psychological mm-hmm. idea that you've unconsciously... And he's very big on that. He's very big on feeling that people have seen things without seeing that they've seen it. Right. That seems fair to me. Yes, yeah, and, well, and I think that's true of all Christ- Christie novels in particular, in a way that Conan Doyle breaks that oh, he rule cheats, all the yeah. time. He, he cheats, cheats all the time. Yeah. Holmes uh, doesn't share everything he knows. Yeah, so we often don't know the things he knows. Whereas Agatha Christie's are pretty much always, sometimes they don't give you every single piece of information, but you'll always be told that information was sought. You might be told right. that Hercule went to look or asked about this or that. You might not be told what the answer is that he found. So sometimes... You might be left. But all of the major clues are there, and you're told about them. Yeah. And if you don't figure it out, you don't figure it out. But, yeah, yeah she's, quite, she's quite big on that in general. That I like that. No jiggery pokery. No here. jiggery pokery. No jiggery pokery. <laughs> <laughs> and so the last point that I wanted to come to, since we're talking about Clue, is the game Clue or Cluedo, as it is known in the UK. Oh, is that? Okay, because I only know it as Clue. Clue. Yeah, it's known as Clue here. It's known as Cluedo there. Cluedo, by the way, is a sort of portmanteau of Clue and Ludo, I play in Latin. That is so British. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And I say that as a classicist. I love you all, but still, really? (laughs) Like, really? What about the Doctor Who clue that we have? Uh, You want something British? British, yeah. (laughs) Interestingly, it's not titled Doctor Who Cluedo. No, it's just Doctor Doctor Who Who Clue. Clue. Hmm. (laughs) But I had to order it from the UK. Yeah. It was not available here. Well, the game Cluedo was invented by a fellow named Anthony E. Pratt. Okay. Who was a big fan of Agatha Christie, not surprisingly. Yeah. And he based the game on the this game that people actually did play of of sort of pretending murder mysteries and trying to solve them. One of which, by the way, is, is in a, a net- not just mur- mentioned, it is the basic plot, plot of one of, of the Agatha yeah, Christie's <laughs> where people, a murder is announced. Yeah. Uh, is it a murder is announced? That Anyway, it's one of the ones where they actually are playing a murder mystery, mystery game, game. Yeah. and then somebody's actually killed during the murder mystery game. Now, to be fair, that's also used by Marjorie Allingham. She uses a version of that where they're at a, a country house and there's a murder. Right. 
I don't think Sarah's ever uses it. I'm not sure if Naya Marsh ever uses it. Those are the mm-hmm. the figures that I think of as the golden age. But at least two different people yeah. do use those settings as actual murders. <laughs> but the game is so Agatha Christie. It's you know yeah. a you know a manor house with various yeah. guests and you yeah. know it's in the library yeah, with yeah. the yeah yeah it's all of the perfectly Agatha Christie. All of the weapons are weapons used in yeah. some murder or another. Yeah. 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 So obviously a big fan of Agatha Christie. But in addition to being a game inventor, mm-hmm. his actual sort of day job was as a musician he was oh, yeah. a, a, you know aspiring composer and he was an accompanist to the famous soprano Kirsten Flagstad ah <laughs> sorry did that sound like I knew who she was <laughs> who she was but I'd like to sound like I do uh, oh, oh Kirsten Flagstad, Flagstad yes <laughs> well, she was apparently quite famous I'm in sure the, she was the, you know I mid 20th know century anyway. early 20th century and I would like to say that she sang in an Ariadne opera. Oh, opera, because there are several operas yeah, of Ariadne. Yeah. In fact, as far as I can tell, she didn't. She sang, however, in Dido and Aeneas. Mm, okay, fair enough. By Purcell. Uh, and I will just say that the Dido character, one of her major elements in Virgil's Dido is Ariadne. And she has elements in her speech in which she channels Ariadne, deserted it's, by it's, Theseus. It's an obvious you yep. know, close parallel in a yep. lot of ways. Yep. And, of course, Chaucer includes the Dido story in his Legend of Good Women. So and Ovid has her as Ovid one of the heroines. Yeah. Yeah. So although Kirsten Flagstad did not sing Ariadne. in Ariadne, her sister did. Her sister, also a slightly less famous soprano, right. Karen Marie Flagstad, <laughs> did sing the part of Ariadne in Ariadne auf Naxos. Right. By Strauss. Right. A very famous version of the story. Yep. And so that nicely uh, brings us back to... The very beginning. The very beginning. Well, that was a surprising amount of information. Though I've got to say that video in the origin was pretty packed. Yes. So maybe I shouldn't be surprised. But I do think we have probably come to a point where we should stop. (laughs) (laughs) So... If you haven't yet listened to Allison and Darren talking about elements of the Theseus and Ariadne myth, please head over to Myth Take and hear their discussion of the primary sources. Always fascinating and really illuminating. And But for now, I think we should end our discussion here. Indeed. And we'll be back soon with some other somewhat random connections. <laughs> <laughs> And we'll see what we're ready to talk about next. Bye for now. Good night. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.